Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck and a very warm welcome to Friday Fretworks and this week we're taking a look at arguably the most polarizing topic in the guitar community, of course talking about Relic guitars. <laughs> Now this is a widely recounted, albeit hypocritical tale, that it was actually Keith Richards who first hit upon the idea of a relic guitar, after approaching the Fender Custom Shop to bash up a Telecaster of his that he was planning on taking out on the road. It was, however, in fact Don was, producer and bass player, who first approached Fender to beat up a bass of his that he was planning on using on a performance at the Grammys in 1990 with Bonnie Raitt. Now, prior to the early 90s, any relic work undertaken on guitars was more often than not done to commensurately age any repair work or restoration work that had been undertaken on genuine old guitars, or in more extreme cases, to create fakes or replicas of specific instruments. Now, bizarrely, it was actually an independent luthier by the name of Vince Canetto who first hit upon the idea of commercially available Relic instruments. He'd been actually making Relic Telecasters since roughly the mid-1980s. It was, however, his replica Fender decals that finally caught the company's attention. However, instead of threatening legal action or reprimanding, a custom shop employee J.W. Black actually approached Canetto the idea of contracting him to work on one-offs or any Fender artist models that Fender were producing at the time. It wasn't long until they realised the potential of a fully-fledged Relic guitar, because at Winter Nam in 1995, Canetto was contracted to build two prototypes, an aged Butterscotch Nocaster and a 57 Mary Kay Spec Stratocaster. Needless to say, the guitars went down a total storm with dealers, and the idea of Relic guitars was born. Now, despite the initial plan being that Canetto simply relay his techniques to the Fender Custom Shop team, strict Californian laws surrounding the spraying of nitrocellulose lacquer, we'll come on to that in a second, meant that, actually, between 1995 and 1999, the first run of Fender Custom Shop Relic guitars weren't produced in Corona, California, but in Springfield, Missouri under the guidance of a small team that Vince had put together. However, a new spray booth in 1999 saw the operation move back out to California, and last year, 2020, saw the 25th anniversary of Fender's Relic guitars. In 1999, Gibson very quickly followed suit. Tom Murphy, of course, the legendary luthier, producing an aged version of their custom shop 59 Les Paul, by which point the idea of the Relic guitar was well and truly established. So the million dollar question, what is the appeal of Relic guitars and why do so many people buy them? And one very common criticism of such instruments is that, for want of a better phrase, they are disingenuous. Traditionally, battle scars are hard-earned mementos of a guitar's work in life, commensurate not only with its player, but its workload. And to manufacture such patina or character is seen by many as contrived. Now, aside from the obvious allure of playing a guitar that looks a bit like the guitars that you saw your heroes playing growing up, one reason people flock to the Fender Custom Shop and more recently the Roadworn series is Fender's use of nitrocellulose lacquer. Notoriously thin and slow to dry, nitro is incredibly easy to wear through and very quick to crack, what known as checking, primarily because the thinners used in the paint continue to evaporate over the course of a guitar's lifetime. Now, consequently, guitars finished in nitro take on a unique character or patina, unique to the player themselves and their playing style. 
Comparatively, guitars finished in the much more common polyurethane, such as Fender's Ultra Series or the Professional, is much thicker and much, much harder wearing, which means that within reason, a guitar produced tomorrow, if it's looked after, could pretty much look exactly the same in 40 years' time. Now, when Yamaha approached me about the idea of a custom Yamaha Revstar, the first thing I knew I absolutely wanted was a nitro finish, not only to be lightly checked in the workshop itself, but to make sure that the more I used it, the more it aged. It ages with me, and you can see that checking very clearly in the Cardinal Black video for Tell Me How It Feels. I won't go into the purported tonal differences or benefits of nitrocellulose versus polyurethane, but suffice to say the debate still rages on to this day as to whether a thinner lacquer allows for more natural resonance within the guitar, thus making it sound better. That said, if you're looking for nitrocellulose finishes minus the ready-made relicking, Fender's American Original Series is precisely that. Vintage specs, US made with nitrocellulose lacquer. By comparison, the Road Worn Series is made in Mexico, again with very similar specs. All the bodies, rosewood necks on the Jason Isbell Telecaster, at least 7.25 inch radius fingerboards, and of course ready-made relicking. But it's worth saying the new Road Worn Series actually come with nitro checking, whereas the old version didn't. Of course, nitro checking can take decades to appear. Of course, more recently, there's also been the Gibson Murphy Lab series, which, if you're looking for your Gibson, not only vintage spec, but with a roughly vintage appearance, they offer them from lightly aged, which is just a light level of nitro checking, through to heavy aged, which is, I guess, more reminiscent of a guitar that spent the bulk of its lifetime on the road. I guess, ultimately, relic guitars cater to those who want the look and aesthetic appeal and character of a vintage instrument without the weight, worry, or more recently, the price tag, which can be associated with those original instruments. As Jason Isbell says in the launch video for his signature Telecaster, a guitar that comes slightly beat up straight out of the box, for him at least, takes the worry out of playing it. As usual though, it's really not something worth getting worked up about. Every guitar company that offers a relic version invariably offers a version without the relicking, usually for less money because of the reduced man hours involved, ironically, in producing a pristine guitar. If it's done tastefully, as with the Jason Isbell Telecaster, I must say I'm a big fan. Some of the heavier age models you see I'm not particularly a fan of, it's just not something that appeals to me particularly, but if they weren't selling in massive quantities, the companies wouldn't be making them. I guess one man's meatloaf is indeed another man's poison. The vibe and character and patina of a well-loved or well-used Strat, Tele, Les Paul, SG, whatever, is one of the reasons that's seen their value skyrocket in recent years. And for the most part, at least, a relic guitar can offer a large degree of that character, or at least aesthetic allure, but for a fraction of the price. Or not, if you're not a fan, I guess it really is that simple. Now I'm going to play you out on my 1980 Greco Super Reel, a Les Paul in essence, that in the process of being refinished was lightly relicked, I guess, or nitro checked at the very least. As ever though, I'm Chris Buck, you're watching Friday Fretworks, thank you very much for watching. Please subscribe, hit that bell icon, and I shall see you next week for another episode. Cheers guys, take care, I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.